Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another Espresso Shots episode of T4C. If you're interested in breaking into engineering, especially as a young woman, then this is the episode for you because my next guest has been a chemical engineer on and off for the last 15 years. And her mission is to inspire girls and young women to enter the engineering field. But before I introduce you to Brenda Denbeston, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that features career advice, insights, and inspiration that you won't find anywhere else. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my espresso drinking engineering lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Brenda Dinbeston, whose title is Continuous Improvement Manager of Continuous Manufacturing at Orica which in case you're unfamiliar with it, is the world's largest provider of commercial explosives and innovative blasting systems to the mining, quarrying, oil and gas, and construction markets. It's also a leading supplier of sodium cyanide for gold extraction and a specialist provider of ground support services in mining and tunneling. Brenda joined Orica in 2016 after spending several years working at BHP as a metallurgist, working with uranium and copper. And prior to BHP, she worked for four years as a metallurgist at ANSTRO, which stands for Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. Lastly, but not leastly, Brenda is the creator of Chronicles of a Female Engineer. It is a YouTube series that demystifies what an engineer does, how to get ahead in the industry from entry level to management, and develop a mindset that thrives in traditional and male-dominated fields. Brenda, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much, Andrea. Great to be with you today. <laughs> Great to be with you. Do you have a favorite coffee, Brenda? I do like a latte, Andrea. I think that is my favorite one. <laughs> awesome. And I know we should let our listeners know, I know you're joining us today from Melbourne in Victoria. In Australia. <laughs> in Australia, where it is 8 o'clock or thereabouts, 8.15 yes. in the morning, and it's 4.15 my time. But it's also, not only are you in a different time zone, but you're in a different season. I am in summer, so I can see the sun is shining, <laughs> and I'm in the future too, so it's already a day ahead of you. <laughs> What's it like ahead of us today? What, what the is, future is looking bright. It's looking good. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, Brenda, let us dive into our 10 espresso shots. These are the 10 questions that I ask guests to help our young listeners, our college students and our young professionals learn how to break into, in this case, the engineering industry. So first question is, what entry-level jobs, Brenda, are available to young people who want to get into engineering? Yes. So people who want to get into engineering need to start getting their experience under their belt as soon as possible, Andrea. And I do try to tell my students as soon as they can to try and get their foot in the door. 
And this can be anywhere from, let's start on campus, on the college campus. Your professors, your lecturers, they currently sometimes have projects running on campus. So reaching out to them, understanding if they've got anything that they're running on campus and getting involved in that. The labs are another great entry point just to get your foot in the door. And look out for some companies that advertise throughout the year that are looking for skills and students. Sometimes opportunities are paid, sometimes they may be unpaid, but I really recommend doing what you can to get your foot in the door. I had the lucky opportunity, I suppose, that outside of my university, there was a BHP technology center that was present at that time. I I did my university in Newcastle, Australia, which is just close to Sydney. And I was able to do a few minutes, a shift role, which essentially was an eight hour role, either in the morning shift, afternoon or night shift. And I could use that and juggle that with my lectures at the same time. So finding something that works well with your studies and also during your holiday periods is much more, much advised. (laughs) Excellent. I just banged your CV against the microphone because I wanted to see what your first title was after you graduated from the University of Newcastle and it was metallurgist. What are the titles that our young listeners should be looking out for on job boards, on LinkedIn, that would signal to them that it's an entry-level position? Yes. So oftentimes junior is a keyword. And in the description, you'll see that they're looking for perhaps graduate. In Australia, a lot of things will say graduate engineer required or entry level professional. Those are the type of things that you'd look for. In my industry, chemical engineers, perhaps you'd look for a plant engineer. You'd look for a chemical engineer, metallurgist, process engineer. So those are the sort of roles in in chemical engineering. Now, mechanical engineering, software engineering, civil engineering, all the different types of engineering disciplines would have different sort of nuances for their entry-level positions. So my experience is very much a chemical engineering experience, but you'll find similar parallels across the other disciplines as well. And that is so similar to other industries, whether it's advertising, marketing, the nonprofit world. It's often very, it's insider lingo. And it could be even unique to the company that you're working for, that they use different titles. Correct. That's right. So keeping it abroad when you're searching for those roles is helpful. Great. So Brenda, what is a useful hard and soft skill that you look for in the young people you hire? And I also want to let our listeners know that on your YouTube series, you devote a ton of time in one episode to talking about the importance of soft skills for an engineer. So I'm guessing your list is going to be super long on the soft skills side, probably longer even than it is on the hard skills. Certainly. So look, typically for engineering roles, you're going to have to have your analytical skills, right? So your degree is your foundation. We know you're a student. We know you haven't had too much time to dip your feet in the water experience wise. So really, we're just looking for some decent grades. We're looking for attention to detail and, you know, some strong analytical background. But in terms of your soft skills, communication is a key, a key skill that we want. You want to be able to to discuss your proposal, understand what the problem is, talk about certain solutions or root causes that you found the problem. Additionally, you need to have a willingness to learn. So you need to be coachable. You need to be an active listener. It helps to be also someone who likes to collaborate because engineers, although we do a lot of the design work and the deep diving, you need to be able to work with others. So being someone who's a team player and can collaborate with multidisciplinary employees is a very helpful skill as well. You also listed out, and this was not a test, by the way, I didn't expect Brenda to be able to rattle off the very long list that she had in her video. But just so you benefit from what she said in the video, she also mentioned the importance of curiosity and asking questions and not being afraid to ask questions. This is very, very important. And particularly because, like I mentioned, I mean, I still ask questions even 15 years later, right? And asking questions really allows you to come in with a frame of mind that, okay, perhaps I do know most of what's going on around here, but what could we improve on? What could we do better? It's not always, you know, looking in the rearview mirror at how we've always done things. And maybe that's my current role, (laughs) that current hat sitting there. But it's about having that curiosity. How can we do things better? How can we improve? How can we make it safer, better and make it a better experience in general? Terrific. So you've kind of touched on this already, but is someone's major 
a deciding factor to get into engineering, Brenda? In other words, if they haven't studied it, if they haven't majored in chemical engineering or electrical engineering or civil engineering or computer science, is it a deal breaker if they want to get into that field? Yes, I would say typically you do need to have that foundation to enter into engineering, particularly as an engineer, you do need to be licensed and you need to have gone through your, your, your full degree for that. I will say, however, that amongst the disciplines, so I could perhaps apply for a job as a process engineer, or I could get a role as a mechanical engineer, despite the fact that I've got a chemical engineering degree. So this is because the skills are transferable. So depending upon your experience and your application in that industry, your experience may be sufficient to, you know, to transfer it in and work as a mechanical engineer. So I've got friends who I graduated with who did chemical engineering roles and are now working as mechanical engineers in nuclear plants. They're working as quality control engineers for Boeing and, you know, in different, in different applications. So once you're in the industry and you've had a bit of experience under your belt, you can transfer across disciplines. Excellent. What about a graduate school degree? And I noticed on your resume, on your CV, that you do not have a graduate degree that I am aware of. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Is it necessary, less so for getting your foot in the door, but more so as you move up the ladder, as you progress maybe into the C-suite, into executive positions, is it important to have that grad school degree? And if so, Brenda, which ones would you recommend? So you're referring to master's, like a master's? Yes. So look, I think this really depends on what your career goals are. So what do you want to do? So a lot of, because I remember this was a question I grappled with as a student because, you know, you've just finished your four-year degree you know, you may as well do another year and a half <laughs> and add your master's to it, right? But it really depends. A lot of employers don't look favorably upon that because they want you to have the experience. They want you to have had some time in the field to understand how things really work and then come back and do a graduate degree, get your master's. So you do find it's much more useful to have done that a little bit later and to get your master's. If you want to end up in management. So if you want to definitely pursue a corporate C-suite career, then an MBA, a master's in business would be advisable to get. And if you want to maybe deeper dive into your discipline. So if I wanted to be to do maybe a master's in engineering management or in an environmental field. So if I wanted to pivot into an environmental application, maybe I'd do a master's in environmental management and seek out a role in that aspect. So it really depends on what your career plan is. And I'd recommend students get experience under their belt first, determine if they really enjoy that field. And then after a bit of time, then pursue the master's or the graduate education. A hundred percent. And honestly, Brenda, that is advice that I personally would give to any person who is graduating from college, even if they no. Oh gosh, I definitely want to be an engineer and I definitely want to whatever it is because you don't know unless you do. You don't know unless you try. And the worst thing that happens is that you get it a couple of years later. And actually I noticed at at least one of the firms where you've worked, it may even be at your current firm, they will either help to pay for your advanced degree or pay for the whole thing. Is that right? Yes. So certainly different employers have got that option where you can be working. What they do is they allow you to study. So you do your studies and once you've passed, essentially they will pay you back. <laughs> so really you have that discussion with your manager, discuss your career plans, talk about additional education and what your intentions are there. And there's certainly that's some of the perks to get them to, to pay you to do that additional study. So definitely that's an avenue that save you your wallet and help you get tangible experience and then use that experience in your additional extra education as well. Oh my gosh. So that's certainly. Absolutely. <laughs> what about life experiences, Brenda? So these are the experiences that we have outside the classroom, whether it's traveling, whether it's growing up in a large family or a small family, whether it's being part of different clubs, whether it's having that 
that little kit that we got as kids for science experiments or chemistry or whatever it is. What type of life experiences do you think our young listeners who are interested in going into chemical engineering or engineering large, should they try to cultivate while they're in college before they get out into the working world? Yes, that's a great question. I think travel is a big one for me. I think international travel has got a lot of things that are helpful in your engineering career. You're being thrown into a culture that you're not familiar with. You don't know the language, perhaps. So you're sort of in a new environment. You have to sort of learn your way around. Maybe you need to learn a couple of new words. You need to lean on people that understand things more than you. So international travel is is experience that is really great because once you get into the industry, again, you're not too sure of everything. You don't know everything. You need to rely and ask questions. You need to find your way around. You need to ask people how they got to where they got to and what, what's the lay of the land in this job and in this role. And yes, I think travel is definitely one. I also think getting involved in clubs on campus and in your community or maybe Engineers Without Borders, some sort of projects that help you work with teams and execute and have a part that you play and you're responsible for. And again, even things that appear mundane, for example, maybe waitressing, you know, someone may be like, how does waitressing help me in an engineering degree? But I like to think that, you know, as a waitress, you have to juggle, you have to, you know, customer service is important. You know, you need to keep your customers happy. You need to deal with issues. So whenever the food doesn't taste good, oh, we're so sorry about that. We'll get that sorted right away. You know, so dealing with sudden changes to the program, as well as also engaging with your your team members, working as a team. Hey, I've got this. Hey, can you handle my table? <laughs> I've actually never been a waitress, but I'm just assuming that those are the things that you'd have to kind of juggle those balls. So this experience all comes into effect and comes in handy when you're now entering into an engineering role. Love that. I also have never been a waitress, but I've certainly eaten in a lot of restaurants and shops and had waiters and waitresses around me. And I think you're absolutely right. Being able to multitask, being able to deal with different personalities, right? And as a woman in a male dominated industry, I'm sure having those diplomatic skills, cultural skills come in very handy. Brenda, what is the best part of your current job as a continuous improvement manager at Orica? So I think the best part of my job is really being able to standardize systems and processes that just make things work better. So my last project was really around upgrading our management of change system. Our legacy system or the historical system was becoming outdated and the software wasn't going to be supported any longer. So really being able to implement a new solution that's common across all our sites and how has everyone doing everything the same way. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with standardization, Andrea, but it really comes to a head in a global company where you've got, where you're operating in multiple countries, numerous sites, and everyone's doing things in a different way to each other. So the simplicity that comes through with standardizing systems and processes and having one procedure that people use, one troubleshooting guide, (laughs) it's just really exciting to know that you've removed layers of complexity and helped people to simplify their day-to-day jobs. I love, and our listeners, when they do listen to this podcast, will not benefit from having seen Brenda's face, which lit up. And she was talking about the idea that things would be standardized. That really excites you. (laughs) It does. Because I think I've seen the complexities of when, you know, we like it this way, but we do it that way. And this is how we've always done it. So just coming, I mean, yes, with change comes a lot of (laughs) barriers and a few hiccups to to walk through. But once that, that stability is achieved, it's definitely worthwhile. Excellent. So every job, Every industry has aspects that really suck, Brenda. What is the part of your current job that sucks the most? Hmm. I have to really dig deep for this one. I think right now what sucks for me, because I'm a big, big people person, is that I don't have a direct team that I'm managing right now. So my influence is very indirect. So I need to influence managers who have got their sites to give me resources or to allow my projects to be (laughs) semi-priority on their list where they're running a site and have got multiple priorities. So what sucks there is that I don't have that 
those people to coach and uplift. And I suppose now being in a COVID environment, a lot of us still working from home, we're all sort of in that situation where we don't have our direct peers, you know, in the office having that ability to chat and say, how are you going? What are you working on? What's your challenge at the moment? And really having to go out of our way to maybe get on the phone or get onto Teams or Skype and have a conversation to understand what people are up to, what are they working on and how they're going if they need support. (laughs) Yes. that I mean, for anybody, certainly for extroverts, this is a terrible time to be stuck at home. And unless you've got a very large family, and do you? Do you have people around you at home? Yes. I've got a little boy, a little three and a half year old. So he's my little son and I've got a husband as well, but he works away interstate, which got a bit complex (laughs) during the pandemic when borders were closing and he was locked in a different state to mine. So certainly there's been different (laughs) things we've all had to juggle during our new, our new normal, I guess. Our new normal. Definitely. Is he back now? He's currently back. Yes. So he's okay. currently looking after my little, <laughs> my little, little one, one running in here and appearing on camera. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Dad. Three final espresso shots, Brenda. What is the best career advice you've ever gotten? So the best career advice I've ever gotten is to always try something, <laughs> especially if you don't know about it. So be willing to try something new. I think it was with the exact words. And this came about five or six years into my career. My mentor sort of said, look, you need to make sure you're not afraid to try something new. There will always be situations that may come across your plate. Put your hand up, <laughs> be willing to try, say yes. So feel the fear and do it anyway ask questions. And this is why I I really embrace the fact of being flexible, saying yes, and and figuring it out as you go. (laughs) And so that's my advice to people at any stage of their careers. Because oftentimes, I think women in particular, we like to be perfectionists. We like to have our ducks in a row. We like to understand what we're going into and what's involved. And do we really fulfill all 10 requirements? But really jumping in. If you've got five or six, you'd say, okay, I'll learn the four as I go. Because people, everyone is in this position, right? <laughs> everyone is figuring it out as they go, but you just don't realize. Feel the fear I and do it anyway. <laughs> love, love, love that advice. And you proved it yet again when you said yes to doing a live stream podcast interview. So woohoo, Brenda. Yes, yes. Okay, now for the fun question. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Amazon, Hulu streaming shows or books, Brenda, do you think accurately depict your industry? So what I really liked was Chernobyl. And Andrew, have you heard about that one? Oh my God, it was amazing on HBO, right? Yes, yes. So that was on HBO and it streamed on, um, I think, Foxtel in Australia. But essentially, there was a power plant in the Soviet Union, which had the largest explosion, a nuclear disaster, essentially. And the scenes in the first and second episodes when the event actually happened in that control room, that really um, resonated with my industry and particularly in control rooms that I've been in as well. So when you see the little indicators, you know, the process control parameters out of specification and you typically have emergency response plans to bring things back into into stability. They chose not to, they chose to deviate from the emergency response plans and that had just drastic ramifications. So that aspect, that scene, and then the flow and effect as well, dealing with the community fallout, the health considerations, having to report to newspapers, all that sort of stuff is actually part of the industry and part of the role. So I think that's really something that I resonated with and felt like, wow, this is something that could happen, <laughs> you know, in my role. So so that resonated well. But I don't feel like there's much else in mainstream movies, in reality TV shows that depicts what engineers really do. And I'm passionate about working with <laughs> film producers to, to, to get something out there, right? And so oh, yes. Yeah. Someone will be listening who will want to make a show. Is there even a reality TV show around engineering, the real housewives of chemical (laughs) engineering or something like that? I'm working on a script. I'm working on some things in the background, but there's nothing out there. 
there's nothing. I mean, I think of like Sex in the City and how they they have their sort of little roles in that space. So something that would you know appeal to millennials, make it fresh and engaging, particularly for women, where things are typically. I mean, you might you might have a National Geographic series that will maybe digs into you know some pumps and you know maybe the industrial side of engineering, but really trying to shed a bit of more feminine light <laughs> on the industry. See, you said pumps. And you had just said sex in the city. So that made me think of shoes, Manola Manola Blahniks. And I'm thinking, I don't think the engineering boot is going to hold a candle to the great shoes that Carrie Bradshaw wore. That's classic. No, no, I was referring to to big um, water pumps or (laughs) equipment pumps. But yes, that does draw a similar parallel. (laughs) That. Brenda is why I'm not an engineer. That and many other reasons. Okay, final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about engineering? So I think Java junkies would be surprised to learn that engineering is very broad. And engineering is probably in the fabric of everything you see around you. So I like to let people know, particularly as chemical engineers, that you can work in a food manufacturing plant. You can make chocolate and work in a distillery and make gin or beer and work in a petrochemical company, oil and gas, mining, the water industry, so we can clean up your water. In the copper industry, we we make copper to go into electrical cables, which powers our houses. So really without knowing, engineers have been involved in some aspect of most of the things we see around us today. That's my hot tip. Oh, cool. <laughs> now, insight. Is insight. Had I known that engineers were involved in chocolate making, maybe I would have gone into the field, but I didn't. I didn't until I started preparing for this interview. I know, right? <laughs> I said it's, a, it's an unkept secret. <laughs> well, we're going to blow the lid off that secret right now and hopefully inspire other young women to get into the field. Exactly. Brenda is the creator of the Chronicles of a Female Engineer. It's a YouTube series that demystifies what an engineer does, how to get ahead in industry from entry level to management, and also how to develop a mindset that thrives in traditional and male-dominated fields. Brenda, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. This was just wonderful. You're welcome. I've really enjoyed our discussion. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.